All right, let's go to the Psalms, if you would, please. Let's go to the Psalms. I want to say very quickly thank you to all of you. Uh, just uh, since our stay here, that uh, uh, the kindness that you all have shown us, and uh, you, you've uh, we've just been overwhelmed with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, blessings from you all, folks that have come. And my Charlie's been over here working every day, uh, trying to get that shower uh, installed, and finally got it installed, and working at that every day, and 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 still is. And other brethren that come and and do different things, and others that have come and given us furniture so that we can be more comfortable back there where we're staying. Uh, I'm very humbled uh, by the uh, thoughts and the kindness and the generosity uh, of the church. And I just want you to know that we appreciate it, brethren. Thank you so much. We're not worthy of it, uh, but we're very grateful for your kindness and your uh, generosity. We, we love you guys and appreciate that. Uh, please pray that we can be a, a blessing and a help to this church uh, that uh, where we're going to be preaching this revival meeting. There's a great need for revival in churches all across the United States. Amen. Okay, I mean, that's been a need for uh, forever, but it just seems like, man, things are just getting worse and worse, it seems like, out in the world. The world's always been wicked, but I tell you what, if there's ever been a time where the church could use some revival, uh, that time is now. Amen. But I still believe that God is a God uh, that can bring revival. Okay, he's just as powerful today as he's ever been. You still believe that? Amen. I mean, God can part the sea today uh, just like he did back in Exodus 14 if he wants to. He can do it today again if he wants to. And so pray for, the, pray for churches that we'll see some revival. And I, I tell you what, I'm happy to see uh, here at our little old church here in Beaufort, South Carolina, the church not just going on, but uh, I tell you what, if you don't know, but the Lord's doing some things. The Lord's doing things in the lives of people. And, um, and, and I'm just very happy to see that God is just still working. He's still on the throne. He's still in control. Amen. And uh, we, we just need to be faithful in our part. God will be faithful on his part. Amen. Amen. Look at Psalms, if you will. Psalm, uh, take Psalm 143 in one hand. And uh, in the other hand, let's go to Acts chapter 13. Psalm 143 is a psalm of David. And concerning David, if you look at Acts chapter number 13, this is what the Bible says concerning this great man, David. Acts chapter number 13, verse number 22, the Bible says, And when he had removed them, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, notice this, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. I want to talk to you tonight uh, for a few minutes on the subject of a man after God's own heart. That's what we want to be like. We want to be men and women after God's own heart. And I believe here in Psalm 143, we'll read one verse of scripture there. I believe there's many verses that we could go to. Uh, that would give us a glimpse into the heart uh, of a man, David in particular, um, uh, a glimpse into the heart of a man that was um, uh, said to be a man after God's own heart. What is it like to be a man uh, or a woman or a young person after God's own heart? I love the Lord, and I know you do too. I assume that you do, and that's the reason why you're here tonight. And we love the Lord because he first loved us. And so because we love the Lord, uh, we want to be men and women and young people and older people alike after God's own heart. Uh, in other words, we love the things that God loves and we uh, detest the things that God detests. And so Psalms 143, if you'll look at verse number 10, I believe we'll get a, a little bit of a glimpse. A little glimpse into the heart of a man after God's own heart. Look at one Psalm. Look at Psalm 143. Look at verse number 10. Psalm 143, verse number 10. Th these are the words of David. He says, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. 
Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. And so here we get a glimpse into the heart of a man after God's own heart. What do we learn? What can we learn from this little verse of scripture uh, so that we might be able to apply ourselves as well and be men and women after God's own heart? Well, let's break this verse down. The first two words of the verse, he says, teach me, teach me. If you're going to be a man after God's own heart, you're going to have to have a teachable spirit. Notice the hunger that David had for the Lord. If you're going to be a man after God's own heart, you're going to have to have a hunger in your soul for the things of God. You're going to have to have a thirst in your heart, a thirst in your soul uh, to be closer, a desire, a fervent and a passionate desire to draw closer to the Lord. It seems like we have so many that are just drifting drifting further away from the Lord. But when you're a man that's after God's own heart, you're going to seek every excuse and every opportunity to draw nearer and closer to God. Look at Psalm 142 or Psalm 42. Sorry, Psalm 42 very quickly. Psalm 42. This will be your heart's attitude when you're a man after God's own heart. Look at Psalm 42. Psalm 42, verse number 1. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Boy, it was hot today. It got so hot. As I was out running errands, uh, I went to Walmart to buy a box of masks to put it in front of the church. And, uh, uh, man, it was just so hot just getting, a, just getting out of the car and getting to Walmart. <laughs> I said, man, I got to get me something to drink, man. It's too hot out here. And uh, I forgot to buy one at Walmart. Then after Walmart, I had to go to Staples to get some more items that I needed. Uh, and so uh, I told my daughter, I said, man, I forgot to get something to drink. I'm so thirsty. My mouth is so dry. And so uh, we went to Staples, and I was just dying to buy me something to drink. And uh, I'm just telling you, my brethren, you know what? If you're going to be a man after God's own heart, uh, that's the way, that's the type of desire that you're going to have in your heart. You're going to have to uh, have a thirst. You're going to be thirsty in your soul uh, to want to get a drink of cold water uh, from the Lord. You're going to be desirous to be closer to the Lord. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. He said, teach me. Matthew chapter 5. He had a, David had a teachable spirit. Now, David was a king. David was a, uh, a military genius. David was a very accomplished uh, soldier. He was a, and he was uh, the greatest king that ever lived in Israel. Uh, so great that God's going to establish uh, his leadership again in the future millennial kingdom. Okay, according to Ezekiel and Jeremiah. But look at Matthew chapter number five, despite David's greatness, one, the reason why David was so great, the secret to his greatness was his humility. His humility. David had a hunger for God. If you're not a humble individual, you're not going to be hungry for God because you think you already know it all. You already know everything. Uh, that's how a lot of our young people are. Be very careful, young people. If you want to, if you want to mature the right way, please listen to us. We love you, and we want to, uh, we want to direct you and give you guidance for things that we've learned when we were in your shoes. Uh, don't get too prideful. Uh, learn to have a teachable spirit. Your parents know things that you don't know yet. You think you know some things, and when listen, and we're not saying that you're totally ignorant. Uh, uh, I told my children, listen, uh, my children are not dummies. If they were dummies, well, how would that reflect on me? <laughs> okay. Uh, we're not saying that you're not smart. We're just trying to tell you that you're not as smart as your parents. And you're not as smart as your grandparents. Okay. Your parents know some things that you don't know yet. You will know eventually, especially when you get your own kids. Then you're going to understand why mommy and daddy said the things that they said to you that at the time didn't make sense. But now that you've got your kids, now... I understand. 
Okay? So, listen, have a humble spirit. Have a teachable spirit. Set that pride aside so that the Lord can speak to your heart and teach you some things that's going to make you a, a, a more successful individual in general. That's going to make you a better mother and a better father and a better husband and a better wife and a better Christian and a better person for the glory of God. You're never going to be a better uh, person if you don't humble yourself and develop a teachable spirit. Look at Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 6. Blessed. You want God's blessings in your life? Well, look at what the Bible says. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Notice, for they shall be filled. If you come to church with a hunger and a thirst in your soul. Oh God, teach me something. Teach me something new. Or uh, Listen, there's, there's a lot of verses in the Bible. I mean, we've read our Bibles. You've been saved for years. Maybe you've read your Bible through a time or two or, or several times or many times. Praise the Lord. But how many times do we read the Bible and we don't understand all that we're reading? I mean, I like what Sam Jones said one time, the old Methodist evangelist. He said, if I understood everything that there is to understand in the Bible, then that would mean that I was just as smart as God. Well, we know that that ain't so. And so listen, have a teachable spirit. When you show up to church, don't walk into that church. Look, check your pride at the door. Check your pride at the door and pray before you come to church and say, Oh, Lord, uh, would you speak to my heart tonight and teach me something else so that I can be a better Christian, a better witness, uh, a better worker on the job, or a better mother, a better father, a better parent, a better spouse. Uh, Lord, teach me. That's what David said. Teach me. He had a teachable spirit. Uh, look at uh, 1 Peter. Well, you already know it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. He says, Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Don't tell me that you have a hunger and a thirst in your soul for God, yet you don't read your Bible. Read your Bible. You read your Bible. Why? So that you can familiarize yourself with God's heart. You want to be a man after God's old heart? You want to see what God's heart is like? Here it is. When you read this divine book, you can feel the heartbeat of God uh, in your very soul if you read it uh, on purpose and, 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 and concentrated. Listen, uh, if you have a thirst and, and a desire uh, to be closer to the Lord, uh, to, to have more of his power and his grace uh, and his wisdom upon your life, listen, you're going to be in the Bible. If you want to develop spiritual discernment, you know how you develop spiritual discernment? By reading this book, the more you read the word of God, okay, the more you're going to develop spiritual discernment to be able to tell the difference between that, that, is, that which is good and that which is evil. That's the problem with our day and time. We've got uh, uh, people out in the world. We're living in a day and time where things that one day was shunned and one day was condemned as wicked and evil is now uh, not only tolerated, but is celebrated as if it's something good. And I'm telling you, it's wicked in the eyes of God. The Bible says, behold, uh, the Bible says uh, 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 that, that, that there would be those that would call good evil. A uh, woe unto them that would call good evil and evil good. That's exactly the damn time that we live in. And if you're not careful, if you don't get in that book, I tell you, it blows my mind sometimes the things that Christians will defend. It really just boggles my mind sometimes when I see uh, the way Christians will defend things that are so obviously wrong. That's a shame, my brethren. And what that simply tells me is that there are some people that profess to know Christ that are not in that book. It is impossible to read your Bible on purpose and not eventually be able to identify that which is wrong and that which is right. If you're saved and you love God and you want to have a heart uh, after God just like David did, you're going to have a teachable spirit. Teach me, O Lord. Teach me. And so uh, let's go on. Let's move on from there. But let me say this again. Uh, notice he said, teach me. That requires, I want to repeat this again. It requires humility. 
If you're a prideful individual, you're never going to be a man after God's own heart. I've used this illustration again uh, before and I'll use it again. But uh, you read in the Psalms where David said concerning his enemies, mine enemies are greater than I. Or mine enemies are stronger than I. Well, my brethren, who was stronger than David? We're talking about a man that in his teen years, in his youth, was killing bears and lions. We're talking about a young man who wasn't even qualified to fight uh, in the army of Israel. And yet, even as an unqualified young uh, neophyte, he was still, by the power of God, able to defeat a giant. By which the experts of warfare in Israel were intimidated by. David took him on and was victorious for the glory of God. David was a mighty man of valor, so much so that he developed other great mighty men of valor. That's what mighty men of valor do. They inspire other men to be men of valor as well. Like I said before, cowards inspire no one. But men of valor, those are the ones that inspire others to be courageous as well. And that's the kind of man that David was. But you know what the secret to his strength was? His humility. His humility. He said, mine enemies, they're stronger than I. But what David was recognizing, uh, he, he was recognizing that if God, if I can convince God, because let me tell you something, God loves his children. You mess with my children and you're going to see a very bad side of me. <laughs> and you mess with God's children and you're going to see a very bad side of God. And so you know what David did? He was really smart. He got on his knees and he touched the heart of God. Oh, God, huh, I can't handle these people. Well, my goodness, if your little boy or girl comes running to you uh, because some bully messing with him, how is that not going to touch your heart as a parent? David was smart. He knew that. He went to God and said, listen, these guys are bullies. <laughs> I can't handle them. David can't handle them? You, you chopped off the head of a giant. Yes, but that was because God was on my side. And so we see David's humility. He had a teachable spirit. But let's move on. Uh, in Psalm 143. If you look at Psalm 143 again. Look at the next couple of words. Psalm 143. Are we okay tonight? Okay. Psalm 143. Verse number 10. He said, teach me. Notice. To do. To do. David was a man of action. If you're a man after God's own heart, let me tell you something, you're going to put the things that you learn into practice. He wasn't just learning these things. He didn't just have a teachable spirit so that he can learn a bunch of stuff and fill his head with a bunch of useless information. No, David had the intention to put it into practice so that he can be a better man for the glory of God. And so that's what the Bible tells us to do. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. You can come to church, a Bible-believing church like this one here, where the Bible's going to be faithfully taught and you can learn everything there is about all the sound doctrine and, and all, the, all the things that are taught in a, in a good, sound, Bible-believing church. But if you don't leave, if you don't walk out of that church with the intention and the determination and the commitment in your heart to put it into practice in your personal life, all of your knowledge does not amount to anything. David had a teachable spirit, but David also was a man of action. That's what we need in our day and time. We need more Christians that are men and women of action. Yeah, it's one thing to preach about how, listen, we need a witness and we need to win souls for Christ and we need to win our neighbors, but, but when are you going to start putting that into action? That's right. I mean, look, take steps, take steps. Give, give a gospel track. Here's a gospel track. And as you take that first step, you'll get a little bit bolder. The next time, uh, uh, you'll give the gospel track, and then you might say something. Here's a gospel track, and Jesus saves. God bless you. And then you build a little bit more confidence, a little bit more boldness. And the next time, before you know it, you're giving your testimony. And the Lord is working in your heart to make you a, a better witness for his honor and his glory. But my brother, if you don't begin to take the first step to put some things into practice, things that you already know you ought to be doing. 
If you're not reading your Bible like you should, listen, uh, start by reading, by making a commitment to read one chapter. Now, I don't think that's good enough, but it's better than nothing. Look at how many of us, how many Christians, are, are they're not reading any chapters. Look, make a commitment to read one chapter, and when that gets easier, before you know it, you'll be reading two chapters. And before you know it, you'll be reading three. And before you know it, you'll be reading more. But you've got to make a commitment to be a man or a woman of action. Make a commitment. Make a commitment that, listen, I'm going to set aside time on purpose to pray. I'm going to take that prayer list that they print every Wednesday night, and I'm going to go over it. Maybe if, if, if Listen, there's a lot of petitions on there, but you can at least go through it section by section. Okay, today I'll pray over the section for those that are struggling with cancer. And then tomorrow I'll pray for the section where it's got our young men that are in the military. We need to pray for our young men that are in the military. And then uh, tomorrow I'm going to pray over the section of the people uh, that need to be saved. Let's pray for their salvation. And then I'm going to pray uh, the next day over the missionaries. Look, step by step. But the point here is action, action. Put it into practice. You can know uh, all of the doctrine about, about praying and, and, and what prayer is all about. But until you do it, you're never going to experience God's power and grace in your life. And so he said, uh, the Bible teaches us to be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. But not only that, look at Psalm 143.10. Psalm 143.10. We're doing good on time. Praise the Lord. Psalm 143, verse number 10. Teach me to do, notice, thy will. Thy will. You know how you can tell uh, if a person has truly been saved by the grace of God? He'll have a sincere desire to do the will of God. The first words that came out of uh, Paul's mouth when he got saved there on the road of Damascus, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You'll have, uh, you'll have an obedient spirit, an obedient spirit. If you have a rebellious spirit, you are not a man or a woman after God's own heart. And we're living in great times of rebellion. They're promoting rebellion. They're promoting it out in the streets. They were promoting it out in the news media. They're even promoting it in some churches. And that's a shame. There's no room for rebellion in the life of a Christian. It is impossible to please God and be a disobedient Christian. Amen. Young people, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. Amen. So when you don't obey them, this is wrong. And so listen, if you want to be a young person after God's own heart, develop from your very youth a, a spirit of obedience, of obedience. And older people alike. I tell you why we have so many rebellious young people. It's because we have so many rebellious older people. And they're following their examples. They're bad examples. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Learn to be respectful and learn uh, courteous to those in authority. When I come across a police officer, I'm respectful to him. Thank you, sir, for your service. Many times when we're passing out gospel tracts, I make it a habit uh, to offer him a gospel tract and, and to thank him for his service because I recognize he has a dangerous job. Not all cops are corrupt. I know some are, and there's no excuse for that. I wish they would get fired and then replaced with some good ones that will take their job seriously. But listen, uh, there's some good cops out there. I've known Christian cops. And you know what? They deserve our, our respect and they deserve to be respected. I believe military men deserve uh, to be respected for the sacrifices that they uh, make uh, for the country. And may have to make even to the ultimate sacrifice it needs be uh, for the liberty of our country. I do not support disrespect to our military. I don't think that's right. When I see a veteran and you see that hat with them, uh, the, all that paraphernalia uh, that I don't understand because I'm not in the military, but you guys understand it. But I understand enough to know this. You know what? Thank you for, for your service in Vietnam. Thank you for your service in, in the Korean War. Uh, thank you for your service at wherever you serve out in the Middle East. Thank you. I think that's proper. I think that's a good thing to teach our children to be respectful. Okay, and so here's the thing. If you're going to be a man after God's own heart, you're going to be someone that's going to have a fervent desire to do the will of God for your life. What is God's will for your life? Now, listen. There are certain things 
that you ought to automatically know is the will of God for your life. I automatically know that it is God's will for me to be a good father to my children. I don't even need to pray about that. I already know God wants me to be a good, faithful father to my children and a good, faithful husband to my wife. There's a lot of stuff that you already know about the will of God. You get so many Christians that are so concerned. Oh, 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 Brother Manny, please pray for me. I'm trying to figure out the will of God for my life. And I understand that. I am too. I'm praying about some things right now. But listen, uh, but be- until you get the answer that you're looking for to your prayers concerning God's will for your life, be busy about the stuff that you already know about that is the will of God for your life. And you know what happened? As you find yourself busy doing what you already know to do in the will of God, eventually God, through those things, will manifest some more of his will to you. Praise the Lord. And so David was a man after God's own heart. You know why? Because he had a sincere desire to do what God desired for his life. Let me tell you something. God has a purpose for your life, dear Christian. God has a specific and special purpose for your life. And that's why you're miserable when you don't fulfill your purpose in life. I'm going to tell you why a lot of people live with bad consciences and, 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 and they live with misery. They're miserable. They're miserable. They're very irritable. They're very easily aggravated and annoyed. And, and, and just the very presence of, of a Christian that is do, trying to sincerely do the will of God will sometimes be offensive to, to, to such a one. You know why some people are like that? They're so full of bitterness and they're so miserable because they're not being obedient to the will of God for their life. And God loves you and God has a special purpose and a plan for your life. And if you would just do it, you would realize that, man, I've been missing out. This is the best life there is. There's nothing better than living. Listen, uh, I got saved at a young age and I submitted my life to serve him. Now, I haven't been an angel all my life. Trust me. (laughs) There's a lot of stuff that I'm very happy that is under the blood of Jesus Christ. All right. But I'm thankful that I gave my life to serve him at a young age. And I'm not ashamed of that. I want my, my children to know and I want all the young people to know that there is not a better life available this side of the grave than a life that is 100% sold out to God. There's not a better one. I don't care what the devil tries to tell you. He's a liar. There's not another life that's more filled with peace and joy and splendor and happiness and satisfaction and contentment and fulfillment than the life of a Christian obedient to the will of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so he says, teach me to do thy will. Let's move on. Uh, Psalm 143, verse number 10. Teach me to do thy will. Notice. Here, here, here's the reason why. Teach me to do thy will. Why? For thou art my God. A man after God's own heart recognizes God's sovereignty. Now, I'm not a Calvinist, so we're not going to get into, and we won't get into all, all the reasons why I'm not a Calvinist. We'll get into that. That'll be a good study for another time. But we do believe in the sovereignty of God. Now, what does that simply mean? All that simply means is God is in control and God is in charge. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Now, we have free will. That's the difference, you see. We have free will. We can, like I just got done preaching in the last point, we can rebel and disobey the will of God. But when you do that, there will be consequences. Okay? But we recognize the sovereignty of God. In other words, we recognize that God is in control and God is in charge, all right? God is in charge. And so, uh, look at this. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Concerning God's sovereignty in the life of a Christian, verse number 19. This is what a man after God's own heart will recognize. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. In other words, you belong to God. If you're saved, you belong to the Lord. He says in verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. 
Jesus Christ shed His divine blood on the cross of Calvary to wash away your sins. But with that same blood that He shed on the cross and that He sacrificed and, uh, through all that torture that He suffered just to save your soul from hell. Listen, with that same blood, He bought you. You know why? Because that's how important your soul is to God. Amen. You are important to God. He loves you and He loved you so much He gave His life and He gave His blood to purchase you just so that you can become one of His own. What a blessing, man, to be a son or a daughter of God. It's a privilege. It's an honor. We recognize the sovereignty of God. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore, therefore, because we recognize God's sovereignty, therefore glorify God in your body. Notice, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If you're saved, your God is. Uh, he, your whole being belongs to God. Body and spirit. See, there's sins without and there's sins within. That's why, well, uh, and I know that the Pharisees, they emphasize, a little, they emphasize a little bit too much of the outside. A whole lot too much of the outside. And the Lord rebuked them for that. But that doesn't mean that the outside is not important because the outside is all that people will see. That's right. You can't see my heart, but you can see what I do. And people will read you like a book. And so that's why having a good testimony, that's why identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ is important. I want everyone around me to know that, listen, I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's been so good to me. He washed me from my sins. The Bible says he bought me with a price. I was so valuable in the eyes of God, as filthy and, and wicked and vile as a sinner as I was. And yet Jesus loved me so much and thought that I was so valuable despite all of my filthy and wicked sins that I was worth his own blood. That's how valuable you are in the eyes of God. It ought to, I tell you, it ought to make you so appreciative for what God did in your life when he saved your soul and rescued you from a devil's hell that you, that you deserve to go to. That you say, you know what, I'm so thankful for what God did in my life. I'll do anything to bring glory to his name. That's the heart of a man. That's the attitude of a man that's after God's own heart. All right, let's move on. We need to close. We got to go to our time of prayer. But look at Psalm 143. We're moving on. Psalm 143. Verse number 10. Teach me to do thy will, o, uh, f to do thy will, for thou art my God. And notice, here's the second reason why David had a heart like this. He said, thy spirit is good. Oh, you know why you ought to give your life 100%, not 90%, not 50%, 100% to God. You know why you ought to dedicate your life to serve Jesus Christ all the days of your life and with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? Simply because he's been so good to us. Amen. Simply because, listen, there's a million reasons why we ought to live for God, but listen, uh, we ought to live for him just because God has been so good to us, my brethren. Oh, thank the Lord that we're, we're not on our way to a devil's hell. Thank the Lord that we're not suffering the full consequences of our sins that, uh, that we've committed. God has, has washed them away and put them under his blood and cast them into the sea of God's forgetfulness. Can you imagine if we had to pay for all the bad things we've done? But God in his mercy has forgiven us and saved our souls. He's been so good to us. And then not only saved us, but the manifold blessings that he gives us. The Bible says that God daily, God daily loadeth us with benefits. Amen. Every single day of your life, if you're, if you're saved, every single day of your life, God blesses you, whether you see it or not. And the reason why we don't see it many times is because we've got our eyes on other things. We've got our eyes on the things of the world. We've got our eyes on a bunch of problems and things that we're worried about. We've got our eyes on everything else uh, except God. And those are the times in our life where we can't see God in our lives. 
But if you'd become a man or a woman after God's own heart and give yourself 100% to God and serve Him with your life, you know what? You'd see more of God and His blessings in your life on a daily basis. Let's move on. Psalm 143, verse 10. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Notice, lead me. Lead me. If you have a heart, if you're a man after God's own heart, you will desire the leadership and the guidance of God in your life. You'll become sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. God, what do you want me to do? That's what I want to do. Lead me, guide me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. One time I was preaching in a prison up in Pennsylvania. And the chaplain there was a pastor. He's with the Lord now, but his name is Pastor Alan Sinkovich. And Pastor Sinkovich was the uh, chaplain there. And man, he was a tough individual. You have to be in a prison ministry. He was dealing with hardened criminals. I'll never forget one time I got to, I was preaching the gospel. And one of the inmates started, uh, uh, started speaking up and, and, and asking questions and, 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 and interrupting the services and t- trying to talk to me in the middle of my preaching. And the chaplain, Pastor Sinkovich, said, Hey, man, you shut your mouth. We didn't come here to hear you. You came here to hear this preacher. <laughs> I said, Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Kept on preaching. And one time, uh, right, before I got, right, right, right before it was time for me to preach, uh, they, they led the singing. And the brother that was leading the singing, he had them singing that song, He leadeth me, he leadeth me. And right around the second or third verse, Pastor Sinkovich, he goes, Wait up, wait, wait, hold it, stop. Right in the middle of the singing. <laughs> and he goes, We can't sing this song because you're all lying. He said, Every single one of you inmates in here, you're a bunch of liars. God ain't leading your life. <laughs> But here's the thing, my brethren, if you're, if you're a man or a woman after God's own heart, you know what? You're going to desire for God to lead you along in this life. Because look how many times we try to lead ourselves and we just wind up in a mess. I'm tired of getting myself in a mess and sticking my foot in my mouth and, and making things worse and worse. When we try to lead our own lives, we just make things worse and worse. But when we let God be sovereign and lead us and guide us, He just makes things better and better and better. Amen. All right, we got to move on before I have too much of a good time here tonight. Psalm 143, verse 10. Lead me, notice, here, here's the last point, into the land of uprightness. And I won't take the time to elaborate that. We can be here all night talking about that. But notice where he, he wanted God to lead him. Into the land of uprightness. When you love God, when you're a man or a woman after God's own heart, you're just simply going to want to do what's right because it's right to do. There'll be no ulterior motives. Some people are in the ministry for money. But a God-called man... That doesn't interest him. You can't buy him off. He's going to preach, thus saith the Lord, no matter whether you offer him a salary or not. You can cut the salary. You can take away the salary. But the Bible still says you're in trouble. <laughs> he just was going, he's just going to do what's right because it's right to do. And he just loves God so much that you know what? I, don't, I want to make sure to be very careful not to do anything that would upset my Lord because I love him too much. That's the attitude of a man after God's own heart. Bob Jones said, do right until the stars fall. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Notice, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, just make it the priority of your life to do right. I I appreciate the testimony of Brother Johnny. By simply doing what was right, by being honest, God blessed him with a good job. Guess what? That's the way life works when you obey God, when you're a man after God's own heart, and you just do right, my brethren, in your everyday dealings with your fellow man, uh, when you treat others right, love thy neighbor as thyself, when you, when you do right, let me tell you something, God will bless you 
beyond measure. David was a man after God's own heart. Let's be men and women after God's own heart. Well, my brethren, that's, that's our message for tonight. Let's go into our time of prayer. And before we uh, kneel and have our time of, of prayer with the Lord, if I can get two uh, brethren to come and pass out the prayer cards, and we'll go ahead and pass these out so that we can pray for our missionaries. But so good to have visitors here tonight. Amen. Thank you for coming. You're always welcome here. Anytime you're in town, this is your home away from home. We're happy to have them here. Good to see my sister Vanessa here tonight. She's my favorite sister. Amen. She's my only sister. She's my favorite one. And I'm her favorite brother. <laughs> I don't know. Don't tell my brother I said that. He's, he can whoop me now. Used to I could whoop him, but he done got big and I got old and fat. So, <laughs> so I don't mess with him no more. Amen. Everybody doing?